light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh as always i'm joined in the studio by my producer joel and today we're going to be covering a serial killer that has been named the doodler killer this killer is still unidentified uncaught and potentially still out there maybe even continuing to murder from 1974 to 1975 the doodler became the most prolific serial killer of gay men in san francisco and the reason why he's called the doodler is because he would actually sketch a picture of his target on cocktail napkins before he would actually go and lure them to a private location in order to murder them during this time in this area of san francisco and northern california Many of you know that the Zodiac killings had happened in 1968 and 1969. So that was kind of, you know, the big serial killer at the time that was uncaught and still, we don't know who the Zodiac killer was. But then in 1970s, the Golden State Killer came along. So the Doodler Killer kind of got overshadowed by some of these other serial killers that were operating at the time. And I think because of this, and also because of the men that he targeted, he kind of went just, he flew under the radar and just disappeared without ever being caught. This is a particularly interesting case because there's actually been some recent developments in the last month or so, as well in the last couple of years. And I think because of DNA technology and where it's at now, it could be possible that we may finally be able to identify who the doodler killer actually is and hopefully bring him to justice if he is still alive. But before we dive into this episode, I just want to thank everybody for subscribing on YouTube because we surpassed 300,000 subscribers, which is amazing. Yeah. I can't believe, can't believe how many people are, are watching and enjoying our show. And we just really appreciate all the support that you guys have shown us Definitely on all platforms. I mean, Spotify now has video in case you didn't know there's reviews on Spotify as well. So if you're a fan of the show, an easy way to help us out that's completely free is just by Go into Spotify, follow us, leave us a review. Apple Podcasts has reviews and ratings, and you can subscribe there as well. And obviously our YouTube channel, we do put a lot of media overlay. Joel spends hours upon hours on really working on the production of these episodes and really making it a visual experience along with the audio. If you haven't enjoyed the show on YouTube yet or Spotify, definitely take a look. But with that being said, this episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Babbel, Purple, and HelloFresh. So typically when we cover serial killers, we're able to dive into sort of the background and history of the individual and kind of take a look at what might have led them to becoming a serial killer. But with this particular case, we have no identity of the killer himself. So we have to just start with the time period as well as the actual crimes. So by the 1970s, San Francisco had become a safe haven for gay men in a time when homosexuality wasn't accepted in the public eye. The gay movement grew alongside the civil rights movement, and people hoped for a more accepting future. Gay men came from all over the world to find communities that would accept them, but the struggles didn't easily disappear in San Francisco. Some followed them there. Although they tried to build a safer and more understanding community in their neighborhoods, the hatred and violence toward homosexuals infected every street corner. Until one day, the dead body of a gay man was found on Ocean Beach on January 24, 1974. He had been brutally stabbed to death. He was face up in the surf as each wave crashed into him. That day a man was taking a casual stroll along the beach when he spotted the body, and that's when he called 911. I believe there might be a dead person on the beach at, uh, right across from uh, Ulloa Street. When the police arrived, they feared the body would be taken out by the strong currents because basically half of the body was submerged in water and the other half was not. So they decided to drag the body out of the water before the medical examiner arrived, which as we know, this could potentially destroy evidence. And again, they thought they were helping the situation by getting the body out of the water and maybe they were, but the man had no ID, a couple dollars in his pocket, a Timex watch on his wrist, and he was fully clothed. Initially, the police identified the man as John Doe No. 7 until they were able to actually identify him two days later as Gerald Cavanaugh. Gerald was a 49-year-old furniture finisher from Montreal, Canada. He was a single man, and not much is known about his personal life. 
What they did know was that he had been dead for several hours after he had been found, and medical examiners discovered that he was actually unconscious at the time of his death. Gerald had been stabbed 17 times in the chest, back, and stomach, and there was also a defensive wound on his hand. Since he had been stabbed so many times, police determined Gerald's death was a rage killing and not a spur-of-the-moment robbery. Plus, the man still had money in his pockets and a watch on his wrist, so it clearly wasn't a robbery. And just based on the stab wounds themselves, it was clear that there was so much anger and hatred behind this brutal killing. And after searching the area, police were well aware that the Ocean Beach public bathrooms were a popular place for late-night hookups in the gay community. So they suspected that the victim was homosexual. Even though gay men felt safer in San Francisco, gay bashing was still common, and local police often turned a blind eye or even took part in the violence. Police were known to raid gay bars and beat gay men, especially between the 1940s and the 1980s. Gay men in the Bay Area at this time period knew to avoid police at all cost, even if they appeared friendly. If anyone was caught in a gay bar, police could always throw around a slew of bogus charges they kept up their sleeves. This included sodomy, gender dress code violations, and lewd behavior. It was literally a crime to be an openly gay person. And oftentimes, if the word got out that they were gay, these men could lose their jobs or their family. The community couldn't trust the police for anything, so they wouldn't even report a serious crime for fear of getting arrested themselves. The police openly hunted the gay community in the same way they went after organized crime. Gay bar owners would have to bribe local officers so they wouldn't raid their bars or harass their patrons. In the years before the 1970s, there was a common practice known as gayola. Selling liquor to a known homosexual was illegal in the 50s and 60s, and even though the law had ended by the 70s, the fear still remained. Officers would harass gay bar owners by parking squad cars outside of their businesses so patrons wouldn't want to go inside. Even though Gayola had officially ended, gay bar owners still had to pay off police officers so the harassment would stop. It was a time when the mistrust between the police and the gay community was at an all-time high, which only hurt the murder investigation. The decriminalization of same-sex intercourse wasn't until 1976, two years after the death of Gerald Kavanaugh. But even then, police would still discriminate against homosexuals. Local news rarely touched the subject when Gerald was found, and most of the big headlines covered the infamous celebrities, like the Zodiac Killer or Charles Manson. So much of the violence against gay men went unseen by the public eye. But for the gay community, violence was common, and many gay men had to fend for themselves since the police wouldn't protect them. After some investigating, police thought the murder of Gerald Cavanaugh was just a random act of violence. But they didn't know. It would be the first of many calculated murders of gay men in San Francisco. When the investigation began, their only lead was the caller who had reported Gerald's body, but the anonymous person had left the area before police arrived, so they suspected that the initial caller might have even been the killer, but they didn't have much to go on. Investigators combed the beach and searched the area, but came up with nothing. Sixteen detectives in total worked the homicide division in San Francisco, and with all the killings going on, they had a full workload through the 1970s. And for more than one reason, the murder of Gerald Cavanaugh might not have gotten the proper attention, and many believe that the doodler was overlooked by police because his victims were homosexual. Also at the time, many had thought murders were always committed by someone close to the victim, a loved one or a family member. But with the rise of serial killers through the 60s and 70s, the motives for homicide became less and less clear. It wasn't until the end of the 1970s when the FBI would give local police departments guidance on serial killers. By then, it would be too late to help the Dooler case. Local police were stuck in the old ways, so connecting dots between serial murders was much more difficult back then. And all around this time period, serial killers like the Zodiac, the Golden State Killer, and the Zebra Killers made it their goal to terrorize random people. They wanted to spread fear through the city and hog the media spotlight. But the Doodler was different. The Doodler wanted to stay off the radar and they preferred being third-page news. They wanted to keep the killing in the middle of the night and not draw any attention at all. And at the time, he never made front-page news. The doodler kept a low profile and tried to blend in as best as he could. He found his victims at diners or gay bars in the Polk Gulch, Tenderloin, and Castro neighborhoods of San Francisco. 
He scoped out areas playing loud disco music and serving drinks, and he would watch his targets from across the room. Then he would draw their portrait on a cocktail napkin and eventually approach them. As a sign of flirtation, he would show his targets the sketches that he had made, which is how he got the nickname, The Doodler. Once he got their attention, he would suggest that they leave the bar and find somewhere more private, where they could hook up, like a dark park or an empty beach. And by morning, the victim would be dead. And this was the typical procedure for the doodler. And not long after his first victim, he wanted to strike again. Joseph Stevens was an up-and-coming drag queen better known as Jay. He was born and raised in the Bay Area and come from a big family with five siblings. When Jay was six years old, he realized he was transgender, but it was difficult to navigate that change in the 1960s and 70s. When he was alive, Jay used the pronouns he and him, and so did his family and friends, but we're not sure what he would have preferred today. He was later drafted during the Vietnam War, but he was denied because of his sexuality. And when he opened up to his family about his sexual orientation, his father kicked him out of the house. With no place to go, he moved to San Francisco in 1966 since he heard it was becoming a gay-friendly place to live. Jay spent more time in the gay scene and quickly became a drag queen immediately after moving there. Even though he couldn't fully transition, he found an outlet that let him express himself as a woman. And to the rest of the community, Jay was likable, quiet, and modest, and he absolutely loved to perform. He could dance and sing and act. And he was also known for his good looks on and off the stage, with high cheekbones, blonde hair, and beautiful eyes. A local columnist, Don McLean, said he had a face that launched a thousand sailors. Jay would often perform Julie Andrews songs from My Fair Lady and Thoroughly Modern Millie. He even looked like her too. But what made Jay stand out in the drag queen scene was his ability to perform stand-up comedy. He had his own show at the PS Bar on Polk Street in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco. He did a set there for several years and gained popularity in the local scene. The Tenderloin area was a rough place to live in the 1970s. It was an area known for its dark underbelly, but also its affordable housing. And over time, it became a gay, friendly community. Gay bars and bathhouses popped up on every street corner. 14 to 15 gay bars formed on Polk Street alone, including the PS Bar, where Jay performed his show. He finally felt comfortable being surrounded by like-minded people who accepted each other. But he always kept his wits about him. He didn't drink and he was cautious whenever he walked down the street. Despite the neighborhood being gay-friendly, gangs of men or teenagers would drive through Tenderloin looking for trouble, and they would shout slurs and jump anyone they caught walking alone. Knowing that victims were more vulnerable while drunk or high, Jay stayed sober through his nights out at the gay bar. He was six foot two and strong, so he wasn't scared of the gay bashing, but he never wanted to be caught off guard. Since everyone knew that the police weren't going to help anyone in the gay community if there was trouble, they had to fend for themselves. He stayed safe throughout the years and gained local popularity in the Tenderloin. In 1973, he received an award for his drag work at Kabuki Theater. His father still never came to any of his drag shows, but he did get Jay a corsage as a sign that he finally started to accept him. By 1974, Jay began performing at Finocchio's Club on Broadway Street in North Beach. The venue had become world famous for its drag queens, and Jay had become an icon throughout San Francisco. He dreamed of one day becoming an international star, but by the summer of 1974, his dreams would come to an end. On the morning of June 25, 1974, a woman walked along a little path beside Spreckles Lake, and that's when she discovered a dead body under a large tree. After police arrived and inspected the victim, they concluded he was a male in his mid to late 20s. His pockets were empty and he had no ID on him. There was blood pouring from his mouth and his nose, and he had been severely beaten and stabbed five times in the torso. Out of all the murder victims that year, he was number 70, and police suspected the victim came to the remote area to have sex, but they didn't know much else. The body was later identified as Jay Stevens by his sister Melissa and he was only 27 years old at the time of his death. Again, the police called it a rage killing, the same as Gerald Kavanaugh's case, and they didn't have much to go on. Their only leads were eyewitnesses seeing Jay leave the cabaret club the night before, but they didn't know who he left with. The police theory at the time was that Jay drove to the park with his own car, 
and maybe the killer rode with him. On the morning of his death, his car was stolen and ended up being involved in a high-speed chase with police. And when they caught the suspect, they concluded that he had nothing to do with the murder. Sadly, the murder case was pushed aside just like Gerald Kavanaugh's murder, and the case was left unsolved. After Jay's death, the owners of Finocchio's club held a memorial service for Jay, and his friends, family, and fans from all over the area filled the entire club and came to pay their respects. And as they mourned the loss of another gay man, the killer was still on the loose. Not even two weeks passed before the doodler struck again. Klaus Christmann was born in 1943 in Germany. He worked for an automotive company in Germany and came out to live in San Francisco near Church Street. He lived with a man named Booker T. Williams and his wife Nancy. Booker had been in the U.S. police military stationed in Germany, which is how he met Klaus. They became good friends and Klaus told Booker how he wanted to go to the United States. At the time, Germans saw the U.S. as the land of opportunities and Klaus wanted to give his family a better life. He had a wife and two kids back in Germany, but moved to San Francisco without them. He hoped he could put his roots down and find a place to live so his family could join him one day. He stayed in close contact with his wife. They wrote letters and talked on the phone constantly, and they were excited to begin their new life together. But as soon as their dream began taking shape, it ended. On July 7, 1974, ten days after the murder of Jay Stevens, another body was found. 49-year-old Auschwitz survivor Talba Weiss walked along Ocean Beach with her German Shepherd before going to work. Her dog caught a foul scent to something along the beach and ran off. So she chased her dog over a few sand dunes before she saw what her dog had found. It was the body of a dead man lying face down in the sand. She immediately called the police and gave her name, but she wasn't at the crime scene when the police arrived. David Tasky, a detective working on the Zodiac case, showed up at the scene. The victim wore a tan leather jacket, blue jeans, and orange briefs. His pants had also been unzipped when they found him. The victim's throat had been slashed in three places and he was stabbed at least 15 times. His neck and shoulders had so many wounds that it looked like the killer wanted to decapitate the victim. Again, the police labeled it as a rage killing, and just like the previous victims, he had no ID on him and his fingerprints and dental records weren't in their system. In his pockets they found a makeup tube, and he wore a gold ring on his ring finger. And because of how he was dressed, and knowing that Ocean Beach was an area for late night hookups for gay men, police assumed that this victim was also homosexual. And they made sure to make a note of it in their police report. The San Francisco Sentinel, the leading local newspaper for the gay community, picked up the story. They also published the names of Gerald Kavanaugh, and Joseph Stevens, and they reached out to their audience hoping they could find someone to help identify the most recent victim. And after they published the article, the victim was quickly identified as Claus Christman. Booker T. Williams identified the body 16 days after the murder, and Claus's wife, 6,000 miles away in Germany, received a seven-word telegram explaining that her husband was dead. Claus was last seen at a gay bar named Bojangles, or the shed in the Tenderloin at midnight. But besides that, the police had little information. Now with three murders of gay men, the investigation had gone nowhere. All they had were the victims' identities and the fact that they were most likely homosexual. At the time, investigators didn't even know murders were connected to the same killer since they weren't trading information between cases. And in the eyes of the police, they had much bigger problems. During the same time, the zebra murders had taken most of the spotlight in recent news. Black Muslim extremists had formed a murder cult that focused on killing white people. By April of that year, they had killed 15 people and injured eight more. Police resources were spent on other crimes like the zebra murders and not towards the doodler murders. And since the victims were gay men, there wasn't as much of an outcry for the San Francisco Police Department to solve the crimes. Luckily, by mid-1975, the Zodiac Killer had slowed down, and the Zebra Killers were caught and put on trial. Two homicide investigators that had worked on the Zebra Murders case turned towards the Doodler Murders. Their names were Rotea Guilford and Earl Sanders. Rotea was the first black homicide investigator in the San Francisco Police Department, and he chose Earl to be 
the second as his partner. As black investigators, they were able to build more trust in the community. They often let petty crime slide while focusing on homicide, which made local criminals trust them. They were able to gather information that others couldn't, and the police department quickly saw them as a valuable asset on the homicide team. But still, the three previous doodler murders were still unsolved. Their cases were known as round necks, a term police gave to murder cases that might never be solved. As they made almost no progress on the cases, it was only a matter of time until another gay man became a victim. Frederick Capin, or Capin, was born in 1942, and he had a very rough childhood. His parents were abusive alcoholics, and one time his mother smacked a beer bottle across his face, which left him with a permanent scar. So he and his sister bounced between foster homes during their childhood, and also returned home to their parents on occasion. They lived in a handful of different places along the West Coast, and every place they lived was an unstable household. As they grew older, Frederick and his sister remained close. They drank together and got into trouble together. And once he was old enough, he left to join the military, where he became a medic in the Navy during the Vietnam War. During his service, he saved the lives of four Marines. And during a freak accident, he was accidentally shot by friendly fire and shattered a bone in his left leg. Through his military career, he received several different service medals and served in three campaigns in Vietnam. He also received the Marine Corps Commendation Medal with Valor, which is only awarded because of extraordinary action in the line of duty. He ended up leaving the military after four years of service, though, and he kept his sexuality private during his entire military career because he knew they would kick him out if they knew. And after he came out to his family, they pushed him away. Part of the reason he moved to San Francisco was to escape the toxic environment of his family and to also carry out his dream of becoming a registered nurse at St. Joseph's Hospital in the city. After he got settled in, his sister called him to check up on him. In the early months of 1975, Frederick's sister wanted to come visit. But after a long phone call, Frederick told her that San Francisco was unsafe. He might have been talking about the murders of gay men in the area, or the murders in general. Either way, he told her to wait. He planned on relocating to Washington so she could visit him after he moved. But she would never see Frederick again. On May 12th, 1975, police discovered another body on Ocean Beach, only a block away from where they found the first victim. He was stabbed 16 times, which again made police think that this was another rage killing. And when they ran the victim's fingerprints through their state database, they found a match. 33-year-old Frederick Capit. One major difference between this scene and the others was that Frederick's body had been moved several yards from where he was killed. But investigators weren't sure why. It could have been to conceal the body in the dunes, or perhaps the killing didn't go as planned. Or someone had found the body but didn't want to call the police. But it was clear that they also didn't want the body to float away in the ocean. So ultimately it was unclear as to why the body had been moved. As the hunt for the killer continued, investigators Earl and Rotea knew the best source of information would be the owners and patrons of the gay bars in the Tenderloin. These bars were known to be rumor mills, and the bartenders gathered a ton of information on any given night. Two of the previous victims had been last seen at a gay bar, so Earl and Rotea began investigating. After some digging, they found out the suspect would draw pictures of his targets on cocktail napkins, and he would use these sketches in order to flirt with his targets. Soon enough, that's how the nickname The Doodler started, and Earl and Rotea began connecting the dots between the separate murders of gay men in the area. After The Doodler's fourth known victim, the police figured that their best bet might be to wait for the killer to slip up. So far, he had almost left no trace of evidence, and the police had nowhere to go with the case. Even though they knew he drew his victims on cocktail napkins, they still hadn't even found an actual doodle. Most of their leads were through rumors and information that spread through the local gay bars. So they hoped it was only a matter of time until the killer would make a mistake. But the mistake wouldn't come soon enough. The doodler was already scouting his next victim. Harold Goldberg was a merchant seaman for most of his life. He was a Swedish immigrant that became a naturalized U.S. citizen in the 1950s. Because of his career, he didn't stay in one place for very long. 
but San Francisco was a city he always returned to. Unfortunately, not much else is known about his personal life. On June 4, 1975, a hiker walked near Lincoln Golf Course close to Land's End Park, just north of Ocean Beach. And that's when the hiker discovered a body that had been decomposing for several weeks. Flies swarmed around the body, and the smell was unimaginable. The dead man was identified as 66-year-old Harold Goldberg. His throat had been slashed and his pants were unzipped with no underwear beneath them. Unlike the others, he was a much older man, and he wasn't stabbed multiple times like the others. So his murder didn't quite match the doodler's M.O. But after looking into his past and realizing that the victim was killed close to the others, investigators knew it had to have been the work of the doodler. But unfortunately, with no leads or evidence left behind at the scene, the case continued on with nowhere to go. We're going to take a quick break and we'll get back with more rumors, witnesses, and even more victims after we return. Whether it's saving more and spending less or getting organized or losing weight, there's a lot of worthwhile goals to set for yourself this year. At the top of my list is learning a new language with Babbel, the language learning app that's sold more than 10 million subscriptions. I'm trying to learn Spanish on Babbel. Not only is learning a new language a fun and engaging new hobby, you can use it while you check off traveling more from your list. The whole Babbel process is addictively fun, fast, and easy. And Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons for real world use. Babbel's 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. And I got to say, I think this is where oftentimes foreign language classes in high school go wrong is they make you sit there for an hour trying to learn a new language. And in reality, you just need 15 minutes to start picking up stuff. Sometimes it's not the length of time you spend on it, but rather the repetition in small chunks. And I think that's where Babbel really, really nails it. Other language learning apps also use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That is some deal. That's six months for the price of just three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Use code LIGHTSOUT because Babbel is language for life. Our next sponsor is Purple because it's funny. There are all these gimmicks that promise a great night's sleep. I don't care what kind of toppers there are or how heavy a blanket may be. It's lipstick on a pig. If you're sleeping on a terrible mattress, your sleep will also be terrible. It's that simple. That's why I recommend sleeping on a Purple mattress. That's because only Purple mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid. It's super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat, which is like the biggest thing for me. I had a memory foam mattress for a very long time and the thing i hated about it was how hot i would get in it i would just feel like i'm in an oven all night long and then i would fall into a crevice every night because memory foam really does remember where you laid before and it was super uncomfortable but with the gel flex grid that bounces back every day so the next night you get on it it's like it was just brand new out of the box i absolutely love my purple mattress and they even have purple pillows which are absolutely heavenly they're super cool. I hate when pillows get hot, but my purple pillow never gets hot because the gel flex grid technology allows for air to flow through it. What a concept. So your pillow and mattress stays cool all night long. Getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. Get a purple mattress and go to purple.com slash lights out 10 and use code lights out 10. And for a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash lights out 10. Use code lights out 10 for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Again, that's purple.com slash lights out 10 and use promo code lights out 10. Terms do apply. And our last sponsor for today is HelloFresh. I absolutely love HelloFresh with my busy schedule. There'd be literally no other way I would eat other than takeout every night, but everybody gets sick of all the same takeout restaurants around your, your house and in your delivery area. So HelloFresh helps me keep it fresh every week with mouthwatering, delicious and nutritious recipes that I can quickly make in 20 to 30 minutes at home. I love the ease and convenience of HelloFresh, the fact I can just go online and I can pick out my meals for like 
a month or two in advance, which is really nice. So I can just set it and forget it. And I'll never have to worry about going to the grocery store, making the list, making all the food, making too much food, and then wasting it after I've just spent all this money that I spent at the grocery store. With HelloFresh, it's 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality. And you can save on average over $65 per month when you order HelloFresh instead of grocery shopping. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including veggie, fit and wholesome, family-friendly and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety. So what are you doing with your life? Just go to hellfresh.com slash lightsout16 and use code lightsout16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, try out HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, and go to hellfresh.com slash lightsout16 and use code lightsout16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts today. So over the years, rumors, hints, and stories passed through bartenders and gossip around town. Investigators heard one story about a well-known actor visiting one of the gay bars in San Francisco. And apparently this actor met up with another man and they went home to have sex. And as they got into bed, a knife fell from the man's coat. As the actor saw it fall to the floor, he bolted out of the room as fast as he could. When investigators heard this story through the grapevine, they were convinced that this man with the knife was the doodler. But even then, Detective Rotea thought it would be terrible if the actor's name got out to the public, outing him as a gay man. The actor actually never made a police report for this very reason, because he knew that they would have had to release his name, and the story would have spread around the neighborhood. Around the same time, another story spread around from another victim who survived a doodler attack. And this victim is only known as the diplomat. One night, the diplomat was out to eat at a late night restaurant called The Truck Stop. The victim was at the bar around 2 a.m. when he noticed a man drawing doodles of animals on a napkin. The diplomat struck up a conversation and eventually brought the man back to his high-rise apartment complex called Fox Plaza, just south of the Tenderloin. When they got up to the apartment, the guest locked himself in the bathroom for a while, and after several minutes, the diplomat knocked on the door to check on him. He then sat down on the bed with his back to the bathroom door. And after a bit, the stranger opened the bathroom door with a steak knife in his hand, and he jumped towards the diplomat and stabbed him six times in the torso. One of the stab wounds went straight into his lungs, and on the last stab, the blade broke off from the handle, where it lodged itself in the diplomat's chest. The diplomat grabbed the attacker and threw him against the wall, and now that the attacker had no weapon besides a knife handle, he ran out of the apartment. As the diplomat looked down at his chest, blood poured into his shirt. And despite having six stab wounds in his chest and his back, he somehow walked himself to the hospital clinic down the street. And luckily, the diplomat ended up surviving. But he didn't go to the police for weeks. He was afraid of the humiliation he would face if his friends or colleagues knew he was gay. But somewhere along the way, he changed his mind and eventually filed a police report while he was recovering in the hospital. Police suspected it was the work of the doodler, but it was far away from where he usually attacked his victims. Most of his victims were found between Ocean Beach and the nearby Land's End, but this attack happened in an apartment where he risked the neighbors hearing commotion or neighbors seeing him. If it was the doodler, it was strange for him to switch up his process, but the victim's description of the man was the first time police had an idea of what the doodler looked like, and it led to the first sketch of the suspect. Investigators could finally put a face to the name. According to the diplomat, the doodler was a young, slim black man, around 19 to 20 years old, and nearly 6 feet tall. And both of the surviving victims confirmed that the suspect attacked them because of their sexuality. Their attacker had said something along the lines of, You're all the same. After hearing the diplomat's story, investigators were certain that their attacker was in fact the doodler killer. After a thorough description of the diplomat's attacker, the police sketch made it to the Sentinel and the Chronicle newspapers in the fall of 1975 along with a phone number that anyone could call if they recognized the suspect. The newspapers also warned that under no circumstances should the suspect be approached, and police hoped that the sketch would draw some attention since they didn't have much to go on. But sketches aren't always reliable. If you can imagine, getting someone to describe the details of someone's face from memory is extremely difficult. 
And since we usually identify faces as a whole, rather than separate details. But the San Francisco Police Department didn't have DNA evidence at the time, so they had no other way to identify the suspect. And since a police sketch had helped Rotea and Earl in their zebra killers investigation, they had some faith in the doodler sketch. After the sketch was released, police pulled over a suspect that fit the description, and when they searched him, they found a broken bat, a kukri knife on him, and they also found a pawn shop receipt that showed he had sold a watch that belonged to Frederick Kappen, but they couldn't link it to the murder. The watch had actually been stolen from Frederick's apartment before he had actually been murdered. Several more suspects were under investigation, in fact, 16 in total. Many were arrested for bringing sketch pads into gay bars and offering to draw portraits of the patrons. One even carried a butcher knife on them. The problem was that since the sketch of the suspect was black, this meant that police could pull over and question any men who fit the description, and the San Fran PD in the 1970s were known to discriminate against black people. As black police officers, Rote and Earl often saw their fair share of racism in the police department, and they were even involved in a lawsuit against the SFPD for discriminating against minority officers. And despite this, the sketch got Rote and Earl closer to catching the suspect. But even though police felt they were closer to solving the murders, the gay community felt more and more unsafe by the day. By 1976, they organized a safety after called the Butterfly Brigade. They gathered other volunteers and armed themselves with whistles. They signed up for shifts and did neighborhood watches at night. If a car drove by with passengers yelling slurs, the members of the Butterfly Brigade would write down their license plate numbers and keep tabs on anyone who openly threatened or offended anyone in the neighborhood. As the neighborhood watch protected the Tenderloin, police kept looking into tips brought in from the police sketch. Most of the tips led nowhere, but some had just enough truth for the investigators to at least take a look into it. And one day, they got an anonymous call from a woman who claimed to know the man in the sketch. She later gave them a license plate number so the police could arrest him. But investigators needed to know more about the man before they could. So they set up surveillance to keep their eye on him. Days later, a psychiatrist known as Dr. Priest in police records called the police station, saying that he had a patient who confessed to the killings. Normally, things discussed with a psychiatrist are kept private by law, but in a situation where the doctor believes a crime has been confessed in a session, or if another crime might occur, they have an obligation to contact the police. The patient turned out to be the same person the anonymous person had called about, and by the end of summer in 1975, the doodler killing seemed to stop. This was during the same time police began questioning the new suspect. He didn't admit to the killings when talking with police, but he agreed to talk with them without an attorney present. He admitted that he had homosexual feelings as early as 13 years old, but he never wanted to be gay. So he began going to therapy and claimed that his therapist cured him of homosexuality. This ties into the dueler's motives because many believe that the killer's urge for violence is a product of the killer's struggle with their own sexuality. It was a form of self-hatred that he redirected towards other gay men. But still, the suspect in custody never admitted to any form of violence. And what's even worse was that the doctor priest wasn't willing to testify against his patient in court. So even though Rotea believed he had the killer in custody, building a case against him seemed almost impossible. Throughout the doodler's killing spree, three victims had survived an attack by the killer. But all these victims also refused to testify against him in court. The actor had actually left town, and the diplomat apparently got too frustrated with the case and backed out. The third victim is mostly a mystery, since the police still hold on to that information, but we know he lived in the same apartment building as the diplomat. This victim was hogtied by someone that matched the description of the doodler, but they weren't killed. They began screaming in their apartment until security arrived, but the doodler had already fled by then. A big reason the victims didn't want to testify was because they didn't want to out their sexuality, which is just sad. The potential backlash from their friends, coworkers, and family members made them avoid taking the stand. They were also aware that the defense attorneys could demonize and shame their sexuality in front of the jury. Since there's no way to testify anonymously, investigators couldn't build a case against their suspect. So the suspect never went to trial. And most of the witnesses to the case also avoided the spotlight. 
and many men within the gay community knew not to out other gay men. There were possibly other victims attacked by the doodler that never wanted to talk to police. So the case quickly fell apart. And as the years passed, detectives moved on to other cases. All of their leads led to dead ends. And the mystery of the doodler slowly faded away. The names of the suspect and the surviving victims have not been released to the public because the case is still active today. In fact, in 2018, the doodler case was reactivated when Inspector Dan Cunningham became lead investigator. Each murder tied to the doodler from the 1970s has been reopened, hoping that new technology like DNA and genealogy testing can help identify the suspect. They've collected blood samples from victims' clothes, hoping that some of the blood might belong to the killer. They also made an aged sketch of the doodler. They took the original sketch from the 70s and made him 50 years older. The San Francisco Police Department believes the doodler is still alive, even living as an openly gay man in the Bay Area. As of April 2021, investigators were watching a person of interest connected to the case, and it's the same prime suspect from nearly 50 years ago. Investigators even questioned the person of interest and obtained their DNA, but they didn't make a formal arrest. He was last interviewed in 2018. Three new developments have been made since the case has been reopened. The first was that Dr. Priest might actually be Dr. Howard Priest, spelled P-R-E-E-C-E, rather than P-R-I-E-S-T. By the time the case reopened, Dr. Priest had already died, but more information might be discovered through him and his past. Another development is that after investigator Rotea questioned their prime suspect in 1976, the suspect left San Francisco and traveled around the United States. So now that we know that, there could be as many as 15 other cases or more that might be connected to the doodler and other cities across the country, specifically in Louisiana. The most recent development in the case is a potential sixth murder victim by the name of Warren Andrews, who was also a merchant seaman, just like Harold Goldberg. Warren Andrews was a quiet man that kept to himself and not much is known about him. But what we do know is that his body was found on April 27, 1975, beneath some overhanging brush in Land's End Park, not far away from where they found Harold Goldberg's body. When Warren was found, he was actually still alive, severely wounded, and breathing very heavily. But sadly, he fell into a coma and died two months later, so he was never able to tell his story to the police. Warren wasn't initially connected to the Doodler case at first because of how he was killed. Instead of being stabbed like the other victims, Warren was beaten to death. Investigators think the culprit might have lost his weapon, so he couldn't stab Warren to death. Instead, they think the doodler killed him with a rock and a tree branch. If there was a struggle at the scene, there might be DNA that can be gathered from the culprit. And with this new evidence and the technology that we have today, police are very hopeful that they might actually be able to catch the doodler finally. After almost 50 years, the doodler case remains unsolved, and many believe the killer is still alive today and out there somewhere. He's been connected to six murders in San Francisco, and many believe that the doodler has killed up to 16 people. New DNA evidence is undergoing analysis, and many investigators believe the case can be solved thanks to this new evidence and technology. Recently, investigators have also doubled the reward for his arrest to $200,000. So if anyone out there has any information on the doodler killer, it's advised that you call the San Francisco Police Department's 24-hour tip line at 415-575-4444. Or you can text a tip to tip411 and begin a message with the San Francisco Police Department. And tipsters can absolutely remain anonymous. So what a what a crazy case. I mean, yeah, so puzzling. I see why. I mean, it's very clear why this was just basically put on the back burner by the police department. I mean, basically, if we had equal rights for all and the LGBTQ community wasn't victimized and tormented for all this time, then perhaps these killings may have never even happened in the first place because it seems very likely that the doodler is absolutely taking out anger that he has about his own sexuality out on others. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that these are 
rage killings. I mean, just the fact that he's stabbing people and just the manner at which he's conducting these killings is absolutely brutal and just shows, I mean, how much rage and hatred he has inside. I mean, maybe that's not the only reason why, but it seems to definitely point that direction. That's for sure. Yeah. It's definitely eerie to think about that. This guy could be out there. It is. And he could be potentially, I mean, most likely probably connected to even more cases across the country. Yeah. Cause it would make sense that after basically he was identified and they just couldn't get enough, which is crazy. Couldn't get enough evidence or people to work with the police mm -hmm. on this case and come forward at that time period in the seventies that as soon as he sort of escaped the clutches of police, he's like, I'm taking off. Yeah. I'm getting out of San Francisco. I mean, it's possible he's re now returned to the Bay area and he's living there still, but where he's in a completely different country or I mean, know, who knows near his be, past yeah. be anywhere in the world. I mean, if they are able to identify him, which I hope they will be able to, I mean, they were able to identify the golden state killer after decades. So mm -hmm. it's like, it seems very possible that, you know, you don't need that much DNA to actually, you know, trace it back to somebody yeah. these days. It's pretty but, amazing. But the lack of evidence in this case is scary. I yeah. mean, this shows this killer was very methodical, like a few steps ahead the, the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he never, like he didn't slip up really. Yeah. He never really slipped up other than with the Warrens killing. I mean, if he did kill Warren, he may have lost his knife or something, mm -hmm. or maybe he wanted to try a different way. I don't know. Cause having a knife, I would think at some point it would cut his own hand and that he would leave his own his blood, blood would be somewhere, yeah. but seems like he's wearing some good gloves the whole time or something. Well, I think, I think part of his whole, I mean, just the fact that he th thinks out these killings so much, it's clear that the guy, you know, almost fantasizes about these encounters. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it could be about more than just hatred towards, you know, people that are gay versus, I mean, there's clearly something more going on. There might even be something sexual mm -hmm. related with this. I mean, there's, he, he didn't leave any sort of like biological you know, fluids or anything at the scene or on the bodies. Otherwise we probably would have figured out who it, who it is by now, but it just seems like there's, there's gotta be more, there's more of an obsession here. And clearly yeah. he enjoys killing. I mean, at, at the root of it, it's like he definitely enjoys the act of stabbing individuals. And I mean, just why not shoot somebody, you know, like, right. like the Zodiac killer, everybody's, you know, was so riled up about the Zodiac killer and the guy, you know, shot people. Right. With a sink, you know, with a gun and like, it's just like to take it to the next level where you're stabbing people 15 times. So much more personal. And how did nobody hear these killings? Like, it, yeah, I guess because the places were remote enough that you just couldn't see or hear. Uh, no, it was just crazy. I mean, yeah. he really planned out where he did these. Right. Things. And th I think there was some stalking involved too. Before he went to the bar and created his sketch of them, I think they probably was stalking his victims and got to see where they were living and you know getting all that information so that they couldn't create a huge evidence trail so they were yeah. already super prepared yeah seems know? like he got better and better at doing it as time went on to and he realized what was the most effective ways to do mm -hmm. it where to leave the bodies because i mean the police just had no clue yeah. and going to bars i mean the victims are already vulnerable being under the influence of alcohol right. You know, and there's tons of people in there, so it's hard yeah. to like pick out people in a dark club. It's or, usually loud. Yeah, and, exactly. Exactly. So. I mean, it's a common place for predators like that to hang out because oh, you yeah. can kind of sink into the background and yeah. not, not be noticed really, and you know, really scout out your your victims that way. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. It's just everybody talks about the Zodiac, the Golden State Killer, you know, the zebra killers, and all that, but very little people I think know about the doodler killer mm -hmm. and he's an absolutely dangerous sick individual that I hope before and I mean hopefully he's still alive it sounds like they kind of have an inkling of knowing I mean clearly I think they know who he is and it's just a matter of getting enough evidence and building a case against him to actually go and arrest him because right. they want to make sure that before they arrest him they have enough evidence they have enough uh, DNA yeah. that ties him to is it going to stand trial right is it going to actually 
is he actually going to be prosecuted for these killings? And I, I, I'm hoping that before the guy, I mean, the guy is definitely much, much older now. Yeah. So I hope before the guy dies that they're able to bring him the justice and get some justice mm -hmm. for these, these poor victims out there. I mean, what, and, what a brutal way to, yeah. to go. And I think he could look differently now. I mean, we don't know if he was using disguises, you know, when the victims right. were having them create the, the sketch. Sketches, so. Yeah, the sketches could be completely off. And then the fact that he's aged now, it's got to be really hard to, you know, identify him or have right. people recognize him. If if it isn't the guy, the suspect, right. the suspect that the police already know. But yeah, it seems pretty clear that it's the suspect that the police already know about you that they so? interviewed yeah. from the 70s i think i think it's just a matter of building the case trying to tie him to it so that they can actually take him down for it but i hope he does for for the victim's sake because mm -hmm. yeah these were these are absolutely brutal horrific killings that really i mean just absolutely had no re i mean there's never a reason to kill but yeah just for the reasons that he went about doing this supposedly is just just completely wrong and it's just uh -huh. sad that that was the state of the world and you know yeah. to some extent stuff like this still happens but at the time i mean it was literally a crime to be openly gay and you could be discriminated against beat up murdered and it's just sad that that was what was happening yeah. at the time and it's almost like they took advantage of living in that time to and targeted well yeah i mean that's why serial killers that's why you see so many serial killers from the 60s 70s 80s is because a lot of the serial killers went after marginalized victims so mm -hmm. uh, minorities uh you know people part of the lgbtq community i mean right. people that the police just didn't care about as much at the time because they were like uh, you know prostitutes things like that i mean we've covered a lot of serial killers that those are the victims homeless mm -hmm. people um you know just all these marginalized groups because the police just they weren't focusing their resources on trying to figure out who had actually killed these people it was you know the the way that they they did law enforcement back then was a lot different than it is now and just you know if they don't have clear-cut evidence to to connect a murder to somebody it just was like oh not much we can do right you know hopefully we'll get some tips and we'll eventually figure it out but that was kind of the extent of the investigation so yeah i mean a really really crazy case it is i'm interested to see what all of you out there think of the doodler killer have you heard of this this killer this serial killer before i'd be curious to know and do you think that he will be caught and brought to justice? But that is where we'll wrap up today's episode of Lights Out. Hopefully you found this episode intriguing and interesting as much as we did. And until next time, Lights Out, everybody. <laughs>